You're listening to the Modern Motherhood Podcast from All Mom Does, and I'm your host, Julie Lyles Carr. I tell you, these few months here in 2020 have certainly not aligned with the way I usually think of happiness, meaning that I'm happy when things go my way, and I'm happy when circumstances are exactly like I hope they had laid out. And I have a feeling that's probably maybe where you're wrestling too with this idea of happiness. That's why I'm so excited for you to hear today from my guest, Derwin Gray. He's a pastor, he is a husband, a father, a former NFL player, and he has some phenomenal thoughts on how we need to take a look at true happiness. And he also has some powerful things to say about what real freedom is. Take a listen. Derwin, thanks so much for being with me on the show today. Hey, thanks so much. And I I totally appreciate that introduction about being an author and a speaker and a pastor. Uh, but I think something that is probably most important is I'm a husband uh, I've been married to my best friend uh, 28 years. We wow. met uh, second semester my freshman year in college. I was 18 and she was 19. Her name is Vicky, and she is an incredible mother, incredible friend, incredible ministry leader. We co-founded Transformation Church to- together. And so, yeah, uh, I am, I am uh, Vicky's husband and Presley and Jeremiah's dad. I love that. My husband and I have been married 30 years and similar, met in college. We were pretty young. And he will sometimes at events and things where I'm speaking, introduce himself as Mr. Julie. And I just think that's the (laughs) sweetest thing. So anytime I hear a guy give a shout out to a wife, I really appreciate it. That is so awesome. So you're now in the Charlotte area, but you actually were born here in Texas where I am. Tell me about that childhood of yours. Yeah, so I was uh, I was born in San Antonio, Texas, on a side of town called the West Side. My mom was sixteen, my dad uh, was eighteen, and so it was basically children having a child. Uh, both of them struggled with various issues, and so my grandmother primarily raised me. My grandfather provided for me. Um, you know, it, it, it was as I look back. There were things that I experienced and saw that no child should ever experience. Like I had normalized emotional abuse, physical abuse, um, violence, substance abuse, dysfunction. I had I had normalized that. But about at age 13, I told my grandmother that I wanted to get out of where I was. And so I always loved football. But at 13, um, I recognized that football was not just a game, but it was actually a vehicle that could take me out of that environment. And so I just I worked really, really hard. I went to a great high school called Converse Judson with great coaches and eventually became one of the best players in the state of Texas. And I accepted a football scholarship to Brigham Young University. And so uh, my family, we were not very religious uh, there was some spirituality, but we never went to church. We never prayed together, um, any of those type things. And so football was pretty much my God. And a God is anything that gives you identity, affirmation, and purpose. And so football, when I played good, affirmed me. When I played good, it told me who I was, and it gave me a mission. Play better, you go to college, you go to college and play good, you may get a shot at the NFL. And for me, the NFL was my version of heaven because I thought that's where I would find ultimate happiness. Mm. And so what did you begin to find as those aspirations and that career began to unfold? Because You know, for a lot of people, that sounds like, wow, rough childhood, sets a high goal, finds the thing that is the channel and and begins to achieve it. How did it feel when you first entered the NFL and what did you learn in the process? Yeah, my my first year in the NFL with the Indianapolis Colts, my wife and I were miserable. Uh, I mean, we went from at BYU, we were kings and queen. You know, she was on the track team. She was valedictorian. I was a football legend. And then we go to Indianapolis and it was just a totally different environment. I was playing with guys in their 30s. The character on the team wasn't very good. Uh, man, it was it was just rough. And we were like, can we go back to college where we lived in a <laughs> 400 square foot apartment and rented chairs for a quarter a month? We were happy. And so about my third year in the NFL, that's when I kind of found my groove. I was I was a team captain. I was playing well. 
And at the end of the season, it was like, there's got to be more. You know, no matter how much external fame or money or even having my wife, like I couldn't forgive my dad. I couldn't forgive myself. I couldn't forgive people in my life who hurt me. I couldn't love my wife the way she deserved to be loved. And that started to bother me because I made a promise to her father to love and to cherish and to protect. And I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know how to love her because I didn't really love myself. I didn't know what love was because I didn't know the one who is love. <clears throat> and so I also live with an incredible amount of fear because once your NFL career is over, it's like, well, what other job are you going to do that's this awesome? Right. And so there was there was this fear of like, what would I do? Like I was okay in school. I was a compulsive stutterer. So like what kind of jobs are there for guys who are okay at school and a compulsive stutterer? So the Lord just used all of this stuff. And then I started getting injured. And so it was like this, it was like God was breaking me down. And also another thing too is I was proud of my humility which is like the worst form of pride. I love that phrase. Say it again. <laughs> I was proud of my humility, which was the worst form mm. of pride. That's so great. Unpack and it. It was like I was I was like, well, I'm the first one in my family to escape the hood and and I did this and I did this and I did this. And so all those good things became God things. And Jesus doesn't share his glory with anybody. And so basically Externally, my life looks great, but internally, everything is falling apart. But by God's grace, when I was drafted to the Colts, there was a guy on the team. His name is Steve Grant. His nickname was the Naked Preacher because literally after practice, he would take a shower, dry off, wrap a towel around his waist and get his Bible and ask my teammates, do you know Jesus? And in my mind, I'm like, do you know you're half naked? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, seriously, it was like the strangest thing to me. And over a five year time frame, we developed a friendship and I watched his actions and they matched his words. I watched when my teammates needed advice. They went to him and he shared the gospel with, 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 with me through word and deed and prayed for me for five years on an August 2nd, 1997. It was my fifth year in the NFL. We were in training camp at a college called Anderson uh, in, uh, Indianapolis. And after lunchtime, I walked to my dorm room and I called my wife and I said, I want to be more committed to you. And I want to be committed to Jesus. And I literally felt a bodily change. Like I felt my conversion. I felt becoming born again. And I cried for three days that there was somebody who loved me not because I was good enough, but because Jesus became my enough. Mm -hmm. That there was somebody who loved me despite my brokenness, my sin, my pain, my dysfunction. That there was someone who said, you don't have to perform for my love. I'm going to perform to show you how much I love you. And so the ultimate performance is Jesus on the cross and Jesus raising from the tomb to not only forgive me, but to give me a new life. And I fell in love with, with him and I've grown in that love every day since. That is so powerful. And you know, for my listeners out there who are like, okay, what? A guy in a towel is the guy who was able to help evangelize you? Go check out the yep. prophet Isaiah. Go check out Isaiah 20. You'll actually <laughs> see that there's precedence for this, which is kind of, I'm not encouraging anyone to go do this. I'm just saying it is biblical. <laughs> Right, Pastor Derwin? It, it is biblical. It, 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 yes, yes. It, it, for for that context, what Steve Grant did was amazing. Four of us on that team are now in full-time vocational ministry because of his impact. Wow. I mean, that is incredible because, you know, any of us who are following Jesus and we're members of our faith communities and we're always looking for great grand plans on how to go and help introduce the message of the gospel to people. And yet so many times, do you find this to be true? It's simply the person who is willing to invest time in relationship with you. Yeah, yeah. You know, that that's like sharing your faith is not a strategy and plan. It's the overflow of being in love with Christ. It, it, it is when, when someone has loved me so well and I'm intoxicated with them, the overflow is I want others to love them well. And the way you get people to hear the message is number one, you, you pray for them. 
Uh, number two, you invest in them not just as a project to be converted, but as a person to be loved. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, ultimately, my new book, The Good Life, is in essence this. Jesus, will you teach me how to love like you? Because people are worthy to be loved. Like, like, like that's the, the ultimate act of happiness is loving people so well that they see Christ in you. We'll get right back to the interview in just a moment. You may have noticed at the top of the show or at the end of the show, I'm always encouraging you to go check out something. It's called All Mom Does. And I just want to make sure that you're taking advantage of this amazing resource for the journey you're on when it comes to your kids, your marriage, your spiritual life, your job, your relationships. All Mom Does is this incredible community of women just like you walking through so many of the same things. And you can go on allmomdoes.com. You'll find all kinds of fantastic blog posts, great information, but also check out All Mom Does on the socials because there's such an incredible community that is developed there. Women encouraging women, women sharing their lives. So So be sure and check it out. I know you hear it at the top and the end of the show, but it's so important. I had to just stop right here and mention again to you, go to allmomdoes.com and allmomdoes on Instagram and Facebook. You're going to find friendship, inspiration, and so much more. You know, for such a time as this, I love that your book is coming out in this season because at the time of this recording, we are still in the midst of the pandemic and trying to figure out what all that means and I don't know if you're seeing it, I'm seeing a lot of it, very, very diverse and strong opinions about where we're at in terms of reopening and people's personal choices and how they are engaging within larger community settings, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And what I'm finding that's interesting to me that has me a little concerned, a little puzzled, and I'd love to hear you speak into this based on the precept of the good life, is I see people almost idolizing what I'm calling the great before. <laughs> like, in this strange way to, to talk about how you said that you had normalized things that were toxic in your childhood, yeah. I see people also trying to normalize what they considered was normal before we yeah. started going through all of this experience. Yeah. And I see people having an idol knocked down and really struggling to see what can be in the future and bright for them if they yes. can't get their life to turn back into what it was before yes. we all went into lockdown. What do you say to people in that circumstance who feel deeply the hurt and the loss, but at the yeah. same time, how does that really equip them well to move forward? Yeah, you know, thank you for saying that because the imagery that I see is that, and I'm speaking primarily to followers of Christ, is that we have built our lives on sandcastles. Mm-hmm. And this big wave called COVID came in and it knocked and wiped away our sandcastles. And underneath the foundation of those sandcastles were idols. And we have trusted our idols of the economy. We've trusted the idols of our quote unquote freedom. We've trusted the idols of I get things my way when I want them. And in reality, we've been trusting in those things and sprinkling a little pixie dust Jesus on top of it saying, Jesus, validate my life. And I think what's happening is that people are starting to say, yeah, I really do need to build my life on the rock because I've hit rock bottom. And when we hit rock bottom, we discover that Jesus is the immovable, unshakable rock in which we can build our lives on. And I'm seeing a new hunger and a new thirst uh, because people are saying the very things that I thought that were going to, quote unquote, make me happy have been stripped away. And happiness should not be something that is determined by external circumstances, because if that's the case, then those things are our gods. And a false god always strips you of your humanity and dignity. And so what's happening now is people are, are, are saying, I want to hear from Jesus afresh. And, and what's interesting is as I work through the Beatitudes, which is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, uh, Jesus describes eight characteristics of a happy or blessed person. The, the Greek word blessed is makaros, and it literally means happy. So happy are the poor in spirit, happy are those who mourn, happy are the humble, <clears throat> And Jesus goes through these eight characteristics of a happy person. 
And it has nothing to do with external circumstances. And, and, and so in essence, Jesus is, is, is saying in this beautiful invitation is he's saying, happiness is not about things perpetually good happening to you. Happiness is about God making us good. Mm. Love that. You know, and, you've probably heard too, I'd be curious to hear you address this. I've heard people in faith communities say, God is not about your happiness, he's about your holiness. And mm-hmm. yet, it sounds like to me that Jesus is directly addressing happiness by the choice of that Greek word. How do you, how do you render all that? Because sometimes we do seem to have in our faith communities almost a sense of, you know, well, if you're really following Jesus, happiness is not part of the equation. How do you How do you render all that? Well, I write in I <clears throat> I write in a good life, and I say happiness and holiness are two sides of the same coin. Mm. Um, I I think it's a lack of understanding, and I'm going to go with Jesus every day, all day, because he's the one who defeated sin and death and walked out of that empty tomb. And if Jesus says makros is the poor in spirit, makros are the peacemakers, happy. So we have to redefine happiness. Typically, what we do is we overlay American and Western values that happiness is I'm having fun, uh, pleasurable. And it's a lot of times our happiness is self-seeking. It's not really true happiness. Jesus delves us deeper into what true happiness is. And if you look at the Beatitudes, it's eight characteristics. And those characteristics are a picture and portrait of Jesus. And Jesus in his humanity is the prototype of who we're we're to become. And so salvation is not just a trip to heaven when we die. Salvation is the God of heaven coming to live in us and mold us into his image, to be conformed to his image. And so therefore, happiness and holiness are two sides of the same coin, that when we are happy in Jesus, we reflect the holiness of Jesus. And when we reflect the holiness of Jesus, it's because we're happy in him. And the Beatitudes is a living portrait of this happy, holy reality that we can experience. So let me pause here. How happy would my wife be or the wives listening if their husbands reflected this this Beatitude? Happy are the peacemaker, for they will be called sons and daughters of God. Happy are the humble. Happy are the pure in heart. Happy are those who mourn. Like, who wouldn't want to be married to that person? Who wouldn't want to become that person? Any form of other happiness is actually like sitting and playing in mud puddles instead of joining Jesus at his banquet. Mm, Love that. Now, you have written that happiness is not the absence of bad circumstances. It is the presence of Godfidence, not confidence, Godfidence. Tell me about that term. Yeah, you know, um, so often particularly as Americans, you know, we say things like, I'm enough, I can do this. And we forget that that's our problem is we think we are enough and and that we can do it versus God saying, no, I'm your enough. Trust me and I'll do in you and through you what you never thought was possible. My, My parenting for my wife and I, our parenting increased when we got on our knees more. Our parenting increased for the better when we said, Lord, I'm not enough. Will you parent my children? Will you help us to 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 move them towards you? And so Godfidence is trusting that God is your enough, which requires happy are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of, of God. In other words, happy are those who know they're not enough because Jesus is their enough. And when Jesus is your enough, you move from self-esteem, from confidence to Godfidence, that God is going to do it, that God is strong enough, that God is able. What are you seeing as a faith leader that is becoming, if you will, a trend that you're seeing in the church? And this is even speaking to the times we're living in, just how things are going to change. You know, I feel like we've been through some seasons where we were trying to help people in their personal growth. 
And maybe we got off the path of always directing them to God for that. Maybe we became a bit too topical, right? (laughs) In some ways. I agree. And now here we are living in a situation in which circumstances are so far beyond our control. And the thing that I find interesting, I'd be curious to see if you've seen these same stats, is that the church is growing in this time, just like your buddy Steve using a very unconventional method to reach four of his teammates who ultimately became people in full-time ministry. I'm seeing this interesting trend that all the stuff and all the things that we try to do to be the church in normal, quote unquote, times, we're now seeing the church growing. I know at my personal uh, faith community, the church where I serve, we've had over 500 salvations come through online in the last eight weeks, which is unprecedented for our church. So what are you seeing that is beginning to bubble up in this season based on where we've been as communities of faith, what we're in, and where we're headed. I'm seeing that churches that have tapped into the missionary heartbeat of Jesus recognize that the online platform is not going anywhere soon, and that it is a way to literally reach the world. And so what we're seeing at Transformation Church in Charlotte is Our online viewership has increased 400%. For Easter, we estimated that 117,000 people watched the message. We're averaging 40,000 people per week watching the messages. We're seeing our church grow and expand beyond America to the entire world. And so moving forward, we think that COVID um, has given people a new hunger and a new freshman, uh, 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 a new hunger and a new desire to say like, man, what I've built my life on doesn't work. Right. And so people are open. And so for churches who are recognizing that the internet and online and Facebook and Instagram and whatever platforms we have, we're seeing incredible growth and we're still able to meet the needs of people. We feed about 325 families per week through our mobile food pantry. We are also uh, doing um, um, hospital heroes and feeding hospital staffs and praying over them. And so our ministry load has just skyrocketed. And so I think that churches who have prepared for the future by recognizing online opportunities are thriving and flourishing. And so I think we're going to see more of that. And even before COVID, we found that people who were new to the faith or exploring Christ or curious would watch on six months, watch six months anyway, before they came to the b- b- building. So I think this is a great opportunity. And I think people want to hear about Jesus, not like four ways to overcome anxiety, three ways to overcome stress. Like, I think people actually want to know about Jesus. And I felt like there was a time in the church that we got so practical that we practically preached Jesus out of the message. Mm -hmm. And the message was more like a pep talk or self-help talk with a little Jesus pixie dust sprinkled on the end. Whereas I think people want to know more theology. They want to know more about Christ. They want to know more about his kingdom. It feels like to me that we're in a season where Christians are going to have to redefine what they say makes them happy about church. And I know that, you know, as faith leaders, we're all wrestling this because we love that we have people who are anxious to get back to being able to meet in the way that we've met before and be able to have those kind of meetings. And yet at the same time, you just sort of can't argue with this. If we are the church and we are to be to the light to the world and we're seeing the light getting brighter and brighter through this situation and through actually having to be remote in a sense. I think it's really a fascinating question and concern and opportunity to ask, how do we define (coughs) the happy church, you know, the good life church, because that is how a church is made up of people who understand what true happiness is. How do you think we need to redefine how a lot of our faith communities operate in their mission statements and everything else when it comes to understanding what a good, happy church is? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing is we got to go to the Bible, right? So the word church Ecclesia is only used a few times in the New Testament, and it simply means a called out one. 
So the church are people who have been called out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light through the work of the king of kings. Church is not a destination. It is a people who have a destiny. And that destiny is to join Jesus on mission out of the overflow of worship as the spirit of God transforms us. Church is not a building. Jesus didn't die for buildings. He died for people. And so for the time being, what we're actually doing is going back to what the early church did. The early church met in homes. They didn't have buildings to go into. Uh, They would go to the synagogues, but around AD 70, 80, people were meeting in homes because they had to because of persecution. And, 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 And so the idea of, well, let's meet together, it's like, no, there's no way that I'm gonna put some of our older people at risk for coronavirus just so we can meet together in a room. And what great opportunity for parents and their children to worship together in their homes. Like we're going to meet again physically, but the online community is not going to go anywhere. That's going to be a strong part. And, and let me address this too. I think there are some Christians who want to meet in church because they feel like the government is telling them, well, you guys can't meet. And I just want to say this, <clears throat> Uh, Let's not get into political squabbles because as Christians, we're not party of the elephant. We're not parties of the donkey. We're the party of the lamb, Mm -hmm. that Jesus is the king of kings. Also for Christians, freedom from a Christian perspective is different from freedom as an American. Freedom from the Christian perspective means this. Every decision I make, I have to ask myself, how does this bless my neighbor? True Christian freedom is not I'm doing what I want to do. True Christian freedom is I'm doing what's best for my neighbor. True freedom is not selfish. True freedom is sacrificial, just like Jesus, the King of Kings. And so I could be as a healthy 49 year old, I could have COVID and be asymptomatic But if I'm around someone who's at risk, I could make them sick and they could die. Freedom is me saying, I want what's best for my neighbor. True freedom is loving God and loving your neighbor as you love yourself. And I agree with you. I think there are times that there's a a large strand of Christianity that is co-mingled patriotism with the gospel and our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus Christ. That is our ultimate allegiance. And my allegiance to him says this, freedom is limited by my love, but love is the ultimate act of freedom because it serves my neighbor. Mm, Absolute fire right there. I'm so, (laughs) so thankful that I I get to hear you speak on this and that my audience does. Thank you so much for that. I want to circle back to family life. I know we started there and I want us to wrap up there. When you came home from that experience, this moment of really experiencing conversion in such a full way, what happened with your wife in that moment? You know, I think I've got listeners who they long for their husbands to have a deeper walk with God, but yeah. I also think they might not quite know what to do with themselves if they had a guy walk back in the door and having really gotten the message. So what was that like <laughs> for your family life? Yeah, well, the first thing is my wife became a follower of Christ six months before me. There was a woman at her job named Karen Ponish. And my wife would come home and say, you know, uh, there's this woman at work named Karen. She's a really nice woman. Anyway, they built a relationship. Little did my wife know Karen had been praying for her. So one day over coffee, she asked my wife, are you a Christian? And my wife said, well, I believe in God. And Karen began to explain the gospel that the good news is Jesus lived a sinless life for us, died in our place on the cross to forgive us because he lo- loves us, rose again on the third day to now live in us and make us a part of his eternal family. And my wife was like, oh, OK. And in the midst of that, she got saved. She 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 kind of really didn't know it other than I love G- Christ and I want to learn more about him. And, and, and so what I would say, what she did so beautifully is she prayed for me 
And immediately she became more respectful. Mm-hmm. Like she didn't try to parent me like I was a child. Um, I think where a lot of wives, the mistake that they make is they love their husband so much they try to control and parent their hu- their husbands, and we sense that as a sign of disrespect. The best thing you can do is pray for him, respect him, but respect doesn't mean you're a doormat or you're emotionally, physically abused. That is no way. But it simply means that you begin to treat him like the man you want him to become. And that was one of the greatest things that she did is that she modeled before me and treated me like she wanted me to become the man she had prayed for. And it was like, wow. And then both of us are athletes. And so, man, we dug into the Bible. We started praying to get together. We started going to marriage conferences to, 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 to together. And the first marriage conference we went to, it just rocked our world. We were like, so basically we've been kind of like roommates. Hmm. But God has something exceedingly more beautiful for us, a depth of intimacy and love that I didn't even know what was possible. And I began to learn to speak her love languages. She began to respect me and call out the man of who I could be. And then we became like this partnership because I'm a visionary. She's an organizer and strategist. And, you know, it's like God it's like a hand in a glove. Like we begin to see each other as completers instead of competers. Ooh, I love that phrase. That's fantastic. That is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, that doesn't mean that we haven't argued. We, we just, we, we now argue with the intention of reconciliation, not of winning. Oh, I love that. I love that. And, and, and we learn don't have an argument when you're both tired. Forget about it. Or hungry. <laughs> or hungry. I've learned that too. <laughs> <laughs> you get hangry. You get hangry. You don't want to bring that into the dynamic. No, no. <laughs> yeah. Well, Derwin, this episode, I cannot wait for my listeners to hear because it is so chock full of so many great things. This will be one of those episodes I have a feeling that people go back and listen to two or three times with a pad of paper and a pen. I know that I'll be doing the same. I can't thank you enough for being with me today. The book is The Good Life. Be sure and check it out. Derwin Gray, I am so thankful for you. Thanks so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. Show notes. We got show notes. Our amazing content coordinator, Rebecca, puts those together for every episode. So after you listen, be sure and go take a look at those show notes where you can find out how to connect with our guests today and all kinds of other goodies that she packs in there. They're just really a phenomenal resource to you based on each individual podcast episode. I want to give a big shout out to Rebecca, a big thank you, and to Donna, who is our producer. They help make sure that the podcast gets out each and every week. AllMomDoes.com. It needs to be in your browser now and All Mom Does on the socials. It's a great place to connect with other women who are in the stages and phases of life that you are, a place where you will find friendship and support, great resources, and encouragement. So be sure and check out All Mom Does. And one of my favorite things... I would love you to come say hi to me on the socials. I'm Julie Lyles Carr at Instagram, Facebook, all the places, and it makes my day when I get to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe and write us a five-star rating and review. Maybe we'll get to feature you right here on the podcast for doing so. In that magical, mythical world of how podcasts work, your, your likes and your subscribing and your sharing, it all really counts, really helps, and gets the podcast out to other people. Can't wait to see you next week for another episode of the Modern Motherhood Podcast. Show notes. We got show notes. Our amazing content coordinator, Rebecca, puts those together for every episode. So after you listen, be sure and go take a look at those show notes where you can find out how to connect with our guests today and all kinds of other goodies that she packs in there. They're just really a phenomenal resource to you based on each individual podcast episode. I want to give a big shout out to Rebecca, a big thank you, and to Donna, who is our producer. They help make sure that the podcast gets out each and every week. AllMomDoes.com. It needs to be in your browser now and All Mom Does on the socials. It's a great place to connect with other women who are in the stages and phases of life that you are, a place where you will find friendship and support, great resources, and encouragement. So be sure and check out All Mom Does. And one of my favorite things... 
I would love you to come say hi to me on the socials. I'm Julie Lyles Carr at Instagram, Facebook, all the places, and it makes my day when I get to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe and write us a five-star rating and review. Maybe we'll get to feature you right here on the podcast for doing so. In that magical, mythical world of how podcasts work, your, your likes and your subscribing and your sharing, it all really counts, really helps, and gets the podcast out to other people. Can't wait to see you next week for another episode of the Modern Motherhood Podcast. Podcast.